we have another fireside chat and we have Dr. Adam De La Zerda. He is actually a professor here, um, professor of medicine at Stanford University. And Dr. De La Zerda's current research is in molecular imaging technologies for studying cancer biology. Did you get that? It's a mouthful. He's also the founder of Click Diagnostics. And we also have Sarah Hollis, uh, who, who will be the moderator. And she obtained a graduate degree also in San Francisco um, in global health studies at UCSF and is now an impact analyst at Medic Mobile. So please welcome them with a round of applause. My friend Ode is this real genius guy. So, you know, like every classroom has you know, this guy who's really smart. This guy is a different, Ehud is a different level. He's like the guy that keeps getting A and A pluses every single time. And A minus for him is like a big favor, right? Um, in college, he used to get A's and A's and A's and A's. He would always get literally the highest class in the, the highest score in the class every single time he took the exam. And that's why I was so shocked to hear that he started failing some of his exams. So he would always kind of get you know, the 100 out of 100, and, and his parents are telling me, look, he's, he's acting a little weird, and he's, he's also, he started to fail some of his exams, and so not fail what he would otherwise call fail, which is an A minus, fail as in, you know, like, fail, fail. Um, they got worried enough, they actually took him to a doctor. And the doctor just didn't quite know what to do with him. It, I mean, he looked okay otherwise, but just behaved a little weird. So you know, just to be on the safe side, he said, let's, let's send him over for a CAT scan. That's just like a scan of his head to see if, just to make sure everything's okay. Well, turned out he had a tumor growing in his brain. And that's one of the reasons why he started acting a little bit weird. So that tumor started pressing against some regions of the brain and, and that caused all the, all the side effects that happened. He started seeing a lot of doctors and you know, he's about 20 years old now only. And, and the doctors that are seeing him are basically saying, look, this is not just any kind of tumor. This is one of the worst brain cancers that somebody can get. Uh, we have a year. We have a year to find a cure. And if we find a cure, of course, he's saved. If we don't, he will die. Now, the good news, they said at least, is that there are a lot of different drugs to choose from, literally about 12, 13 different drugs to choose from. The bad news, though, is that it takes us about three months to know if the drug is even working or not. So essentially, it means we only have four bites at the apple, if you will. We try one. If it doesn't, we go to the next one, and so on. So Eud goes into his first treatment. They're trying drug number one on him. A month later, I'm meeting him, and I'm asking, hey, how's it going? And he says, he's very cheered up. He's always super positive. He says, look, I'm really positive. I, I, I know that this is working. Drug number one, we got lacked out. They chose the right one. I said, really, how, how do you know? That's wonderful, but how do you know? He says, look, I just feel so bad inside. I feel like I want to kill myself inside. So, so it, it has to work. It's just something there just has to work. Well, a few months later, we heard the news. It didn't. And so the doctors are moving to drug number two, which didn't work either, then drug number three, and then drug number four. And neither one worked, and it would pass away. And when something like this happens, and you know, if you live long enough, eventually you meet people that, that suffer. That's just, that's just inevitable, unfortunately, in life. When something like this happens, you ask yourself, what happened here? How, how could we have missed that? Maybe out of that list that you chose, they cho maybe they chose the wrong form. Maybe these doctors are idiots. Maybe they know nothing about how to treat people like this, like Ehud. And so I started to look a little bit more into this. At that point, I just started graduate school here. And, and I said, I, I'm an electric engineer, never took a single class of biology in my life. Maybe, maybe the doctors knew nothing about how to treat him. Let, let's look a little deeper into this thing. And as it turns out, the doctors were not ignorant. They were actually quite insightful. But it was really the fact that they had no tools whatsoever to know whether a drug is working or not. And they were right. When they said it takes three months to know whether a drug is working or not, they were actually right. And so as I was starting to look more and spending more and more and more time understanding, is this just one case example or is this more of a broad, broad example of what's actually happening in this world of, of cancer? Uh, turned out it is actually more or less true. So. Um, you know, if, if you're interested enough in this topic, you can go online and look for a whole bunch of images. But this is one that I always felt was more, was very exemplary of how, how poorly we have done as a, as a cancer research society over the last 50, 60, 70 years or so. If you look at how many people actually die from cancer every year, this is for men, there are also similar statistics for women, you'll notice there are a lot of trends. This goes all the way from 1930 until the 2000s or so. 
And you notice a bunch of trends. Anybody wants to point to some, some trends here? Yes? Lung and bronchus cancer go up. Exactly. Anybody wants to guess why this is? Smoking, thank you, exactly, good. I gave this talk once somewhere in the middle of the country and, and the answer was very different. So yes, it is smoking. Um, anybody sees anything on the positive side? What? Stomach cancer, right. So stomach cancer used to be the number one killer of all cancers. And yet today I bet that almost none of you know anybody that has ever suffered from stomach cancer. It's extremely rare. If you do, then it's an extremely rare case. So what is it? What, what saved humanity from the number one killer of all cancers? What medical technology was it? Yeah. What? St stomach. They took the stomach out. Mm -hmm. that, well, unfortunately, we still have stomachs. <laughs> oh, OK, good. So uh, what's your name? Ray. Ray. So Ray says maybe when they found out that these pe people have stomach cancer, maybe they removed the stomach out. That's an interesting hypothesis. Anybody has other suggestions? Yes. Sanitation. What's your name? Ben. That sounds kind of weird, Ben. Because if you think about it, we had 70 years worth of clinical research with you know, the greatest minds of history trying to understand the basic elements of cancer research and, and the basic biology of cancer. We have x-rays, we have MRIs, we have a lot of different drugs that are coming in, we have surgical tools that can help us even remove the stomach. Turns out, Ben is actually right. Turns out, the number one reason why we have no more stomach cancer, essentially, in, in this country, has to do with the invention of the refrigerator. Has nothing to do, literally nothing to do, with any medical technology or medical drug imaging technique or whatever that came and saved us. It's literally the invention of the refrigerator because you see, Ben, what happens when, before we had the refrigeration capabilities, we used to eat spoiled meats. And in those meats, we had this bacteria called, bacterium called H. pylori. And H. pylori grows in spoiled meats. And when we eat it, it starts attacking the lining of the stomach. And that, over time, causes stomach cancer. So we've not eliminated stomach cancer all around the world, but certainly in developed countries like the United States, stomach cancer is no longer a thing. So take a moment and, and reflect a little bit on this. 70 years worth of, worth of cancer research with the greatest minds of, of, of our time spent towards cancer, and yet the number one good thing that you're seeing in this graph has nothing to do with any of the work that has been done in cancer research. And that's not to take away from the, from the impact that and the great insights that the field of cancer research has developed over the, and, and found over the last many years. It just means that we probably are fighting this, this fight blindly somehow. Somewhere something has gone terribly wrong here because we're, we're not doing so well. Generally, the trend is pretty flat, and, and when it goes down, it has nothing to do with research. So um, this kind of makes you think, well, what, what, what's happening here, and, and how, can we, how can we better approach this? And, and one of the things that I've been focusing for the last you know, quite a few years of my life has been to join this community of people that are trying to trying to understand how can we better approach this and, and how can we allow physicians, how can we allow doctors to have better insights towards what's happening in the body so that they can, find, so they can fight this war, essentially, um, with understanding what's actually, what's under, what's actually there. So um, we're going to do a little bit of an experiment together. This is, we're going to start with that, with that one particular kind of cancer that I personally feel very strongly about, brain cancer for reasons that you now all know why. And I want you all to imagine for a moment that you are all brain cancer surgeons. So you're in the surgical room right now. Your task is to remove the tumor from this patient that is sitting right next to you here. You're looking down at this person's brain. The skin and the skull have already been removed, and you're looking down at the person's brain. Now you have this MRI in your hand here that shows you that there's a tumor about the size of a golf ball or so in the right frontal lobe of the person. So it's somewhere right, right there. And you're looking down, and yet everything looks the same. And you have a knife in your hand, and you're like, all right, where do I cut? But everything really looks the same. So what do you do? 21st century medicine. You've been trained for 15, 20 years. You're one of the world's best brain cancer surgeons. You're practicing in Johns Hopkins, Harvard, Stanford, whatever, UCSF. What do you do? Turns out the best technology you have 
available to you is your thumb. So here's what you do. You take your thumb and you start pressing against the brain because it turns out tumors tend to be a little stiffer, a little harder than, than the healthy brain tissue. And that's how you find out because everything otherwise just looks the same. And so you start punching in and you start kind of like, you know, touching a little bit the brain until you see that there's a region in that brain that's a little, a little stiffer. And then once you find out what that region is, you take the knife in your hand, you start cutting and cutting and cutting. And then you take a little, and then you, you missed it, all of a sudden it kind of went away. So you go again with your thumb, you go a little bit more, you found it again, and you go again with the knife, you cut a little bit more. Oops. That's not my slide, I promise. Um, oh, I think I know what happened. So I probably pressed this thing accidentally. Let's see, maybe that's. Is better? Okay, great. All right. Sorry. So. Um, now you had some time to think about this, and, and so, so now you removed everything that you believe is, is really the brain cancer, according to what your thumb tells you. Um, and then of course, the, now the biggest challenge of all starts now, because now you need to know what to do now. Do you wrap up the case and, and, and risk that maybe there are a few cancer cells that were left behind and they could grow and become tumors again? Or do you take some extra margins around what you thought was the tumor, just to be sure you removed everything? And as it turns out, that's what typically happens, and those margins can be as much as an inch around the tumor, just to be sure to remove everything, which is, mind you, a healthy brain you're cutting out. Um, and so that's really very, very, very crude. So what I thought I'll do is I'll share with you just one, one example of, of, of one of the work that came out of, of the research we were doing here at Stanford to try to tackle this exact one problem. This is by no means the only problem we have with cancer research, but it's one that is, I, I think, you can have a physical sense for why it'll be important to try to solve that. If you could only tell the doctor this is where the tumor is, just remove that and leave all this healthy brain intact, that would be kind of cool. Um, and so we, over a period of a few years, we developed this really interesting camera. That if any of you are interested, just send me an email or come over after the talk. I'll tell you more about how it works. We have very little time now. But um, this camera uh, can really look down into to tissue and, and sense down to single cells and tell you what this cell is. The way it works is we're, we created these gold particles, a tiny, tiny little bit of, of nanoparticles of gold. We're injecting them to the bloodstream by the billions. They go all over the body and kind of like secret agents to knock on the door of every single one of the cells in our body and ask them, are you a cancer cell or a healthy cell? If you're a healthy cell, we're moving on. But if you're a cancer cell, we're grabbing onto you and we're signaling out and telling you, hey, look at me, I'm here. And so we're going to do an experiment together. Thank you. So we're going to do an experiment together now to see whether this thing is actually working. So what you're going to see now may be a little gross for some of you. So uh, in an audience like this, at least 20 or 30 of you will look down <laughs> while I'm showing the next slide. And if you do, that's perfectly fine. Don't feel embarrassed. Right? So I apologize. You just had lunch. It makes you feel not good. Uh, that's OK. But what we're going to do now is we're going to take a, a tumor from, from a, from a person that actually has a brain tumor. So we're removing the tumor from this brain and we're going to implant it into a mouse brain just so that we can, so we can start testing this technology first on, on animals before we take it into humans. So what you're going to see here is an actual brain tumor that was implanted into the mouse brain. Um, and we're going to ask a surgeon to start removing the tumor. We're not going to show the surgeon the images we're making, but while the surgeon is cutting, we're going to take some images to see where the tumor is and how much was left behind. So um, you're looking down into, into, the, into the brain. You can see that this is the entirety of the brain. You see this is the area of the tumor. Sometimes tumor are a little bit discolored. This is one example where it's slightly discolored. Not always, though. So here's a tumor. Now, without showing the surgeon, we're going to take an image. And you see that the gold particles that we injected before, half an hour, just half an hour before, all went to the tumor, are lighting up like the light of day and tell us, hey, we're here. So we now see where the tumor is. But now this is where the cool part starts. Because now a surgeon is going to start cutting out piece by piece out of the tumor. The surgeon just removed the first quadrant of the tumor here. We take another image now, and we see that this first quadrant is now missing, which means that you know, we're, he's actually taking out the tumor. The surgeon is now removing the second quadrant, the third, and now what appears to be everything. And remember, at this stage, now the surgeon needs to decide, do I take some extra margins or, or I'm or am I not taking out anything else, risking that maybe there's some cancer left behind? Now at this stage, now we're showing this image to the surgeon. And for those of you with sharp eyes, you'll notice that there are two tiny little red dots there. Can, can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, on a Mac screen, it looks a lot better. But 
um, you, you can actually see that there are two tiny little red dots there. And that, those are actually residual tumors that the surgeon would have never been able to see because they are way too small for any naked eye or, or for a thumb to, to, net, to sense. And so we're showing this to the surgeon. We're asking, well, now, instead of just taking those extra big margins, just, just remove those dots. We asked the surgeon to remove it. The surgeon did. We're putting out our microscope. I'm going to spare you all these histological images and so on. But lo and behold, these are, in fact, the extra margins that the tumor was really kind of penetrating into the brain, as many times tumors do. They don't just grow like a bulb, but they send those fingers into the brain. And at this stage, now, we're looking at a brain. It's completely clean. At this point, we also healed the mouse and sectioned the brain and went slice by slice to make sure there's really no tumor left behind. And in fact, there really was no tumor left behind. So we're really excited about this kind of technologies because they allow potentially a world where surgeons that are actually operating on people would actually know what to remove, remove the entirety of the tumor, all the cancer cells, but then minimize the amount of damage and extra healthy cells that they're taking out. So uh, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Um, And this is probably a good transition to the chat we're going to have. So, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. That was amazing. Um, your work is really important, and um, I just want to learn more. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you a few questions about not only your research and the example that you showed here, but your journey to um, how you got to be doing the work that you're doing now because it's very specific work, right? Um, and you said before your background was in engineering, actually. So how did you get to the place where now you're doing cancer research? Was it from uh, the personal experience and the personal story that you had with your friend getting sick? Or um, kind of talk a little bit about, it about definitely, that. It definitely was that. So I, I, I grew up hating biology, completely hating biology, because in eighth grade, that was the last time I took a biology class, I had this terrible teacher that used to laugh at me that I have big ears in front of the whole class. I think it's illegal to do this today, but she, she, whenever you raise your hand and ask questions, instead of saying, yes, Adam, she will say, yes, Dumbo. I don't know if you guys saw Disney movie. It was, we had, you know, somebody you have love-hate relationship with your student. This was definitely a hate-hate relationship. Uh, so it was a terrible experience. This was the last time I took a biology class. Uh, went through high school not wanting to touch this thing. Even in college, you know, undergrad, biology is this place where they laugh at you for having big ears, don't want to go there. Uh, it really left a <laughs> very, very severe mark on me. Uh, so it's only when I came here for grad school, and the reason I came to Stanford, I was very much into quantum physics, and that's, why, that's what I wanted to do. Um, I came here because Stanford is one of the world's best quantum physics groups. I wanted to work in this quantum computer concept that, is, that seemed to, be pretty, to me at the time to be really cool. And, uh, it's only through that personal experience that, that I became really interested, not in biology, God forbid, but in medicine. At the time, you know, I knew nothing about nothing almost, and so, so I, I didn't know that medicine and biology are so closely related to one another. I said, I'm interested in, in medicine, and through that I realized, actually, you have to touch biology for that. And slowly and surely, that, that PTSD kind of wore off, and, and, uh, and I got there, yes. So I think this is a really good example of how sometimes tackling some of the largest problems like brain cancer um, requires you to kind of think outside of the box and perhaps join people from different disciplines, um, like an electrical engineer um, crossing over into the field of medicine and thinking of a technology that maybe someone who has been a physician and a clinician for their entire lives might not have thought of. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the importance of this interdisciplinary dynamic and perhaps give a few examples of the types of different people that you work with on a daily basis and maybe even the challenges of working with people that in some ways speak a different language um, and come from a different background, different training and have fundamentally different perspectives about the work that they're doing and how it impacts the world. So, so this is literally one of the topics I'm most passionate about. It's enough that I, I started a class just about this one topic. Um, see, one of the things that we're realizing now, remember that graph I showed you that things have been pretty solidly bad across the board in cancer. One of the things we're realizing now is that you know, biologists are amazing people, chemists are amazing people, engineers are amazing people. They all had individually as a discipline, they all had 70 years to figure this out, and they didn't. They, 
each of these disciplines alone created amazing, amazing things, but, but turns out this was not sufficient, or this is not sufficient to really make an actual dent in, in those graphs that you saw before there. So if you really are serious about trying to solve some of the world's most difficult, challenging diseases, uh, it has to come, so at least I believe, it has to come when many people are coming together from very, very different disciplines. And that's not easy by any means. If you've been trained in biology, you've been trained to think of, of the body or a cell as a black box, right? And this black box, you know that you're never going to be able to go down enough number because at some point you're going to hit a layer that you just don't really know what's happening there. And yet if you're an engineer, if you're a computer scientist, let's say, that, you know, that's writing code, you know that you can really build your code from the ground up, right? This is not top bottom, this is bottoms up. You can run your code and at every single moment in time as you're running your program, you can stop, you can debug it, and know what is the variable, what is the value of each and every one of the variables in your program. It's fundamentally a different way to think about things. And, and one of the challenges that, that we've had over the last 10, 15, 20 years is that people from these individual disciplines start to get together and start to see, can we work together but the number one barrier that they've had is common language. And I'm not talking about English versus Chinese versus Hebrew versus whatever. This is a common language of being able to come together and, and, and try to understand just enough that maybe as, a, as an engineer, I'm never going to turn into a biologist, but I know just enough so I can communicate with other biologists so, we, so I can bring in some ideas that they might have not thought about. I think one of the most exciting things you see today in medicine is some of the most most novel and creative ideas are coming from people that came from outside of medicine to medicine, to biomedical research. And, and you see it across the board. So cancer is just one example, but there's so, so many, many more. Um, my wife actually is going to defend her PhD thesis at Stanford here in, in a few days. She's a material scientist and she's been trying to study type 1 diabetes. And turns out, you no know, material scientist, immunologist slash type 1 diabetes, sis, whatever you call it, uh, they, they never used to work together. <laughs> They're like two different worlds. Turns out um, they discovered through her, that, part of that kind of research that type 1 diabetes has a fundamental aspect that has to do with the mechanics of the materials in our pancreas. And the reason why some kids develop type 1 diabetes is not just having to do with chemistry and biology, but also some kids are born with pancreas that are a little stiffer. And when the pancreas is a little stiffer, that triggers the immune cells to start attacking the pancreas. That leads to type 1 diabetes. That's the discovery that she made. Um, and you would have never had it if you, if you were only working in immunology and trying to understand type 1 diabetes. That, the tools, the, the, the insight of, of saying, hey, let's try to measure how stiff this material is. Nobody thinks about it when you're studying immunology. That's just not a thing you do. Um, that's one of the cool things when you have people from different disciplines coming together. So a lot of ideas sound really stupid at first. Um, some of them might, might be, but, but others are quite ingenious. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I think it's really important that this sort of collaboration continues. And it sounds like there's a positive trend with universities and different industries kind of creating incentives for that to take place. Um, can you think of like any specific incentives that could increase that sort of collaboration or maybe like in which spaces can these people um, come together? Is it at conferences, at hackathons? Um, I mean, publishers incentivizing these sorts of individuals to come together and do research together, like different funding mechanisms. I mean, what do you think is a good way to encourage this? Because at the end of the day, Stanford still has departments separated. And um, you know, if you're going to medical school, you have to take a certain set of classes and you have to have a certain set of a certain profile. So um, I'm just wondering, does it take a whole shift of the entire university education system? Or what are other ways that you think this trend could continue? That's a really good question. So, so I, I'm a firm believer. I don't know if I have any colleagues from Stanford here. I hope that it, if they do, I hope they wouldn't get too angry at what I'm saying. I'm a firm believer that in 10 years from now, if we still have departments in university, it's only to justify the presence of a department chairs, literally. <laughs> because there's no reason whatsoever that you should have departments. I did my PhD in electrical engineering here, and one of my best friends from that department did his PhD in electrical engineering, but his advisor, his research, was, were in the music department. And so this is really, really cool, because he did things in the music department, 
that no graduate student in the Department of Music would ever be able to come up with because you no, know, he had the engineering tools that, at his disposal. Um, so this is where a lot of really, really cool things happening, and I really certainly hope to see barriers between departments disappearing. Uh, at some point, we can talk about the politics of how to get this to work. But I think the, you know, there's a there's a good there's a good saying when there's a where there's a will, there's a way. Um, you you only need to live enough years in life to be incentivized to solve something that you care about in medicine, because unfortunately, we all know people that have suffered through different kinds of illnesses whether that's an infectious disease or, or, or cancer or cardiovascular, whatever it is. Um, and I think one of the important roles for university or, or for other educational systems is to, is to satisfy the hunger of, of, of your will to try to make a change in your life, in, in, in your education, in, in what you do. So when you're ready to make a change, let's say you were you studied something, you studied to become a biologist, and at some point you say, you know what, I really care about X or Y or something. The role of the university should be not to tell you, hey, you should really care about type 1 diabetes because that's where the world, this is where all the money is, but rather when you're ready, when you decide that this is what you want to do, we're here and we'll help you do lateral transition in your career, whether you're pre-undergrad, whether you're postgraduate, whether you're a grad student, a postdoc, whatever it is. Um, one of the things that we do in the company that I started a few, a few years ago is we're taking people from whatever field they are, so long as they feel really strongly passionate about the, sol the topic we're trying to solve. Uh, in my lab at Stanford, I'm, I'm often taking one of, one of the kids are in my class is an astrophysicist. Um, never did anything in medicine before, but he's really passionate about this. And you can see the passion in his eyes, and that's, that's all that matters. Beyond that, we'll teach him whatever he needs to learn. He's smart enough, he'll figure it out. That's encouraging to hear because I think a lot of times um, as students are entering into undergraduate school or graduate school, you feel somewhat confined to follow a certain prescription of classes. Um, but I think more and more now, people really um, appreciate a well-rounded student and a well-rounded working professional. And it's, it's creating innovations like this, having that sort of um, thinking and, and kind of worldview and different experience. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the areas in your research that you're most excited about, like some areas of, of promise um, that kind of keeps you up at night and things that you're just really excited to tackle? Sure, yeah, so, so in my lab we're, we have both projects that are clinically oriented, so kind of the project that I just showed you that we're hoping that if everything goes well, this, this is going into patients within a year time or so. So, and, and in my lab, for example, we have a neurosurgeon in my lab that's, that's operating on actual people, and he's going through that transition of taking into the surgical room and so on. Then we also have another aspect in my lab, which is more of a basic science question. You know, tumors are, are quite heterogeneous, even inside them. Um, I'll make a quick questionnaire. So, so a tumor about the size of a sesame seed. Anybody wants to make a guess how many cancer cells are in a sesame seed sized tumor? Sesame seed is kind of small, right? Roughly how many? Like one, ten, a hundred, gazillion, a few million, a hundred thousand. So it's somewhere between that. It's about a million or so. Yeah. So you guys are roughly right. Now think about that, right? Typically, when we find tumors, they're about ten times that size or or a hundred times that size. And even as a sesame seed sized tumor, there are one million cancer cells. And as it turns out, these cancer cells are not all identical. They're very different from one another. They grew differently, they are, there's a huge diversity both at the genetic level, they occur, occur different mutations there, they're also behaving differently in a whole slew of different ways. Some of them are pretty good where they are, and they're going to stay and form a larger and larger tumor, while others are not kind of, they're more, in either there's, there's an expression called spielkes, where you kind of keep, can't stand still, you have to move around. And these are the cells that are forming metastasis, where, that are branching out of the tumor and going out other places in the body. Um, that's, that's a very, very different kind of cell. Turns out, we all know that cancer spread throughout the body. Nobody has ever seen that. Nobody has ever actually seen this one cell breaking off from its neighbors and start to travel around. Where does it go? How does it know where to go? Does it go to the nearest blood vessel or is it just a, kind of like a random walk and so on? So there's some fundamental questions that we're now using the same imaging tools, that, like the ones I've just showed to look at cancers and what cancers to remove and what health, what's a healthy brain. We're using that to try to answer some fundamental questions about 
how tumors behave, but not with biological approaches, but rather with very engineering approaches. We're just imaging thing. Uh, and I'm very excited about the concept of imaging. Um, you know, if, every time you can see something new, something that nobody has ever seen before, something good happens. You know, the invention of the, of the microscope, for example, gave birth to, to the concept of antibiotics. Right? We would not have had antibiotics if it were being able to see a bacterium. Um, we would not have had it without, without a microscope. So I'm pretty excited about trying to see new things in new light and see what these cells are doing, where are they going, why are they doing what they're doing. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. But I was, I was wondering, so I know that so much time and thought and late nights and conversations went into making this research an idea of reality to where now you, you have your own company and now you are really deploying real technologies and having real doctors use them. At what point did you kind of gain enough momentum to really shift that idea and that research into, into a reality and into something that could actually make change? I think that's a really hard gap to jump sometimes. And I, I don't know if you have any advice to give for bridging that gap or like something that kind of sticks out when you think of that, that time. So you know, if we were almost in any other place in the world, I would have said, yeah, you're right, this is tough. Uh, we're all incredibly fortunate that the area where we're living, the Bay Area, has so many, many, many different options to, and people that would be excited to help you find your path and, and find and answer some of the questions of, of how to take your invention over to, to a reality. Um, I think this is so, so unique to this area that you have both the industries, you have the investment community here that want to take ideas out of, out of you know, research ideas from university to become actual products. Um, so, so one of the, and I can talk for hours about this one topic, which is a mentor in life, but, but one thing that you'll do really, if there's one thing you take out of this you know, roster of, of ideas and, and suggestions I have is the following. Uh, at some point in your life, you need to find a good mentor or mentors that will carry you through and will explain to you how the world works and, and show you their path and, and help you with this. And it's not gonna be kind of like a formal thing where you go to them and say, hey, will you be my mentor? And they'll say, oh, of course, yeah, just sign here and come here, come on Monday at 5 p.m. and we'll start our mentoring session. But it's some more deeper relationship that, start, that, that, that behaves over time. Maybe it starts from some, something, maybe you, both of you like the same sports or something, but, over, but you, f you have a feeling that this, this person can really teach you a lot about, and, and you're intrigued enough about the career that this person has taken that, that they can really teach you something about it. Um, those mentors are invaluable because they open doors, they share insights with you, and, and there are tons and tons of them out there. And they, these guys had their own mentors too. Because you're not, it's very hard to really succeed without having people to kind of take you through and hold your hand in tough times. And, uh, and almost every person I've met here in the Bay Area that, that has done well uh, have a very strong sense of, of karma that needs to be passed on to the next stage. So, so chances are if you, have, if you find somebody that you feel like, you know, this, I can really learn a lot from this person, chances are this person has a lot of guilt in him or her. And they feel like they need to deploy this, this guilt out to somebody else and, and give this guilt over to you. So, so, and and being, being a mentor is, is a great way to, to give out guilt. Yeah. I had a Jewish mother, you know, guilt is very core in, in everything we're doing. So, so. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you.